I um, wanted to kind of um, talk about our objectives here today. If I can figure out how to work this thing. There we go. So we're going to focus. I'm going to focus on three primary objectives. Um, we're going to look at the types of pressure ulcers, including deep tissue injury, identifying the differences in skin inspection versus wound measurement and skin assessment, and recognizing some of our multidisciplinary team members and developing your protocols and programs for pressure ulcer prevention. I'd like you to take maybe just a minute or two um, to write down on your notes pad somewhere what um, you think is the priority need or gap in your work area to prevent, for preventing pressure ulcers. So think about your specific work setting and what you see as the what kind of the priority gap that, that you would want to take back to your, to your setting. For prevention. For prevention. Okay. Pressure ulcer yeah. prevention, specifically. We'll go ahead and move on then to the next slide. Keep those. We'll, go, we'll refer back to those at, um, at the end of the presentation here. So, oops, bear with me. So I wanted to just kind of review some basic things about pressure ulcers. Um, it's been um, the literature and CMS um, data indicates that nearly uh, up to 3 million people are affected with pressure ulcers. I know Dr. Zaborin. <coughs> had mentioned that there's that number of chronic uh, ulcers is higher, but this is actually extra um, taking out pressure ulcers specifically, not all chronic wounds. Um, and it does have a significant impact on patients' quality of life. It increases the length of hospital stay, and some studies have suggested as many as five days increase in the length of stay for patients, and it, of course, increased health care costs. The estimates by CMS on this data that I collected here um, estimated that up to $11.5 billion is spent on pressure ulcer uh, treatment and care in the United States. Again, Dr. Zaborin, I think, had a figure of $50 billion. Um, and there again, I think that would include and encompass more than just specifically pressure ulcers. Up to 4.5% of pressure ulcers um, that are acquired in the hospital were considered to be preventable. Um, and in 2008, uh, CMS did discontinue reimbursement for hospital-acquired pressure ulcers. Um, elderly patients, as Dr. Zaborn also mentioned, are at much higher risk for developing pressure injuries um, and ulcers. Uh, due to comorbidity, health conditions, age-related changes, debility with um, uh, conditions, uh, health conditions, and ability to mobilize uh, nutrition aspects are also considered into that. Um, I want to just kind of give a disclaimer. I'm an old nurse, and I learn pressure ulcer, so this whole transition to the terminology of pressure injury has been really, I don't know why, but kind of a challenge for me. So I'm going to kind of use them interchangeably, uh, so bear with me with that. I'm still trying to train myself to say pressure injury. So. We are too. Thank you we for are. that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. It's been really, it's, it's hard, actually. So um, just a little information about hospital-acquired uh, pressure injuries. Overall, hospital-acquired conditions in general have actually decreased, and this is data based on the Agency for Healthcare Research and, and Quality. 2006 hospital acquired conditions were reported about 13%. That decreased in, in 2015 to 9.3%, so a significant decrease going in the right direction. Um, hospital acquired pressure ulcers also showed some de decrease during that same time frame from 6.4% to 2.9%. As Dr. Zagorn and Kate also indicated during the introduction, pressure injuries have started to incrementally increase uh, since this data was um, published. So we are seeing an uptick in pressure ulcer injuries, and full thickness and unstageable ulcers have essentially kind of remained the same during that 2011-2015 uh, timeframe. So how does 
CMS identify what a hospital-acquired condition is? Well, they look at three <coughs> primary things. Um, let me see. I think I missed this. So let's look at this graph. So this graph um, actually breaks down how uh, the percentages of all 11 hospital-acquired conditions broke down in percentages. <coughs> you can see that pressure ulcers um, are 23% of all hospital-acquired conditions next to adverse medication events. So we still, we still see, a good, we take a pretty good chunk of the pie, in, a, in other words, about outflow pressure ulcers that are acquired in the hospital. So how does CMS determine what is a hospital-acquired condition? Does anybody know? Have any ideas? I didn't know. <laughs> some, some methodology. <laughs> some methodology. <laughs> so, these, they, um, so these are the conditions that they've determined qualify as a hospital-acquired condition. It has to be high volume or high cost. Pressure ulcers are both of those, um, as we talked about with the amount of money and the amount of um, Americans that are affected with pressure ulcers. It also has to be um, uh, identified as a complication or a comorbid condition to the admission um, diagnoses. And pressure ulcers are a complication of um, a person's hospital stay. Infection is one. Perhaps surgical debridement might be, need, be needed. So there's a lot of comorbidities that can occur with that, as, as well as death um, uh, included in that. And they're considered to be, the <coughs> considers them to be reasonably preventable using evidence-based guidelines. So CMS has kind of tied payment to value-based care. And when they collaborated with the Center for Disease Control, they came up with these 11 um, hospital-acquired conditions. And they considered them to be reasonably preventable um, when you apply evidence-based practices to, to those particular conditions. Um, in 2008, CMS um, has determined they will decline payment for any hospital-acquired pressure ulcer, stage 3, stage 4, or with a progressive pressure ulcer, stage 2, for, for instance, to stage 3, stage 1, that progresses to a stage 3. And they're looking at from the time of admission to the time of discharge. That's the time frame they're looking at. So if somebody acquired a stage 3 pressure ulcer on, on our watch, at, and it's present at discharge, and it wasn't documented as present on admission, that is a hospital-acquired pressure ulcer. Um, <clears throat> so what, what do we define best care practices at? Well, currently, um, the, we have the definition that's been provided that it's really based on the, the literature that is current and um, also expert opinion. And that represents the best way we know of to prevent hospital-acquired uh, pressure ulcers. It used to be when, um, when I was a new nurse and um, I went to uh, where I met um, uh, Lana um, as a new nurse. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the place I wanted to work, <laughs> but it was the best place in my hometown to work. And I moved back to my hometown um, to raise my family. However, I was really, really fortunate to be able to work with some great leaders and, and um, innovative thinkers. But one of the things I can remember is that pressure ulcers, when you got a pressure ulcer, it was a, a reflection of poor nursing care. I mean, have any of you been around long, as long as, you know, and did you get that? You know, if you got a pressure oh, yeah. ulcer, it's your, it's your it, you know, it's nursing's fault. They didn't do what they're supposed to do. Well, that... Fortunately, has changed. <laughs> um, it's still kind of the realm, and, and nursing is still the cornerstone of pressure ulcer prevention. So we do carry a lot of that weight on our shoulders, but it has broadened and it has included other team members and becoming more of a team approach, especially when you're developing programs and protocols within your hospital. So it's kind of evolved past that, and thankfully it has. Um, 
So what are the best practices for pressure ulcer prevention that you want to use in your specific healthcare setting? Um, there are a couple things that you want to look at when you're implementing and looking at best care practices and, ev and evidence-based uh, care. It's necessary to recognize that implementing best care practices at the bedside is a really complex task. It sounds really simple. Well, you just prevent ulcer. You just put them on a mattress. That's it. You're, it sounds really simple. That's all. But when we only look at nursing, we can say, yeah, that's kind of simple. But we need to include all those other team members with that. And that makes it a real challenge when you have a multidisciplinary team that you have to include in part of your programming and prevention. So that includes nurses, that includes your providers. We talked about getting providers more engaged, dietitians, OTPT, um, you've got specialty services. So you may be looking at specialty services as general surgery to do debridement if that's necessary, podiatry, um, and plastics. You might be referring to those to those folks for care as well. So it encompasses a broad range, and that's adds to the complexity of the task. It's multidisciplinary. Um, many discrete areas, like Dr. Zorgan had mentioned, need to be addressed. So it's not just one thing where you can de develop a standard operating procedure. Um, in my hometown, we have manufacturing um, clinics and uh, Fisher Control, now Emerson. But they have standard operating procedures for their assembly line work. I wish it were that easy for nursing. And we really don't have the ability to kind of make that. We can come up with protocols, but it has to encompass more than just nursing. It's, um, it needs to be customized, meaning it has to be um, individualized to the patient. So patient A's needs is going to be different than patient C down the hall. Patient C's needs is going to be different than the person in the ICU. So we have to customize and adapt that program and protocol for prevention. And it's routinized. I mean, it's a routine. These are repeated tasks that are repeated over and over, and they have to be repeated over and over without failure. Because if you miss, CMS considers that a failure, um, and especially if it's not documented. Um, wanted to also kind of tag on to Dr. Zorn's comments about, uh, and we talked a little bit about uh, preventable, avoidable, unavoidable. Um, many clinicians, myself included, I, I am totally agreeable that despite best practices, despite every intervention that you have in place uh, um, based on the knowledge we have, patients are still going to develop um, pressure ulcers, and I'm glad he touched on that today. Um, I think it's certainly um, a reason why we really need to look at can we really achieve a zero percentage rate on pressure, no pressure ulcers in our in our healthcare settings. So skin assessment, um, this is what we all learned as nurses, um, maybe not the dietitians, <laughs> um, uh, in our um, um, at programs, our nursing programs, there are basic five parameters for skin assessment. We're looking at touch, touch, look, feel. So you're looking at the skin, um, you're touching the skin, um, and you're making determinations of what the skin is, whether it's normal or abnormal or at a range of those parameters of normal. So you're looking, you're touching, you're looking for temperature changes in the skin, especially over bony prominences. Uh, you want to look for that, and um, dark colored skin is difficult. So we've got a lot of different range of skin tones, uh, you know, from white to, to very dark. We have to be um, sensitive to that, that people with dark colored skin are not necessarily going to present with typical non-blanchable erythema. So you really have to touch, because some of the studies indicate that one of the characteristics of um, injuries, skin injuries for dark skin people is temperature change. So the, te the area that's injured is feels warmer than the surrounding tissue. The other thing is pain. So if they have the ability to sense um, uh, pain response, um, they, they can tell you that, hey, you know, this, uh, this really hurts more when I'm sitting. I don't know what the problem is. And so that could be an indicator as well. Of course, um, some color, moisture level, 
overly um, moist skin, macerated skin, and, and dry skin, both ends of the spectrum, they're much more vulnerable and susceptible to skin injuries and um, uh, movement injuries as well. Uh, turgor is the skin, how well hydrated the patient is. And then, and then lastly, is the skin intact? Do you see any rashes? Do you see any areas that are um, indicated, in, indicative of a, a pressure injury perhaps or some other type of skin injury that's, that's present? So those are kind of the parameters of skin assessment. And skin inspection is a little bit different. Skin inspection can be taught to your, your techs, your CNA techs. They can, during dedicated care times when they're repositioning patients, when they're doing baths, they're kind of your eyes at, at the bedside too. And so teach your CNAs how to look at the skin and identify, hey, you know, this, Kelly, this person's got this rash that wasn't there yesterday. Would you take a look at it? They can't assess it, they can't um, do that part, but that's, they can alert you that you then need to go and look in and examine and assess that skin. So that kind of <coughs> brings me into um, skin, as, uh, how often are you guys doing your skin assessment? How often do you perform your skin assessments in your work areas? I see you, how often do you do a skin assessment on patients? Every four hours? Every four. Every four. How about med surge? Every eight, eight, to eight, to eight to 12. Eight to 12. Eight to 12. Does it depend on a shift, whether it's an eight hour shift or a 12 hour shift? Is that kind of that, how you identify that? Okay, so a pretty big variance, four, 12. So it really, again, that kind of targets your population group. And I'm glad to hear that, that that, you, that, that has been considered in terms of those high risk patients. Um, it's not, skin assessment is not a one-time event. You have to do it repeatedly. You don't just do it at admission, although that's an important time to do a skin assessment. Admission, discharge, anytime a patient is transferred to another unit. And risk assessment um, should, is also recommended that you do that with a change in the patient's condition. Are you all kind of, on, you've kind of been doing that change in condition? Good, 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 good. Um, one thing is a kind of a long-term care nurse, um, what I have become to appreciate and really value is when we get patients into the long-term care setting and admit to um, those facilities, it's really nice to have what their Braden scores are. It really helps us because then we can kind of plan when they, come into our facility about maybe having those supplies available at the bedside, the low air loss mattresses perhaps, uh, special uh, skin barriers, those kinds of things can already be readily available when the patient walks in or comes through the door. Um, there's no delay in getting those, those items uh, set up for the patient. Um, <clears throat> and the, the um, Skin assessment, uh, and this kind of ties in with the risk assessment, it's critically important that that be um, in the EDs, the emergency room. So the minute they walk in the door, that skin assessment is determined. That's really a critical entry to your hospital in terms of skin assessment because it's there you're going to identify any um, ulcers that you can call pressure ulcer or present on admission in it. I don't know about your experience in your hospitals, but some of the notes I'm, I'm um, seeing when, and when I'm reviewing patients that are coming in through the outpatient clinic, physicians are getting better at that. Uh, their notes are indicating and specifically saying present on admission. So I, I think, you know, continue to get the word out and really emphasize that. Um, I, think, I think, you know, perhaps it's catching on and it might be just maybe in isolated areas, but in my area, I'm seeing a little bit more of that, so I'm happy to see that. The other two critical areas are your OR and your recovery rooms, um, that you have a skin assessment at those entry levels as well. Those are high risk um, times, and you wanna have that documentation on your skin assessment at that time. Some um, hospitals have an integrated electronic health record with your risk assessment form, skin assessment. 
does everybody have that available on your EHRs? Okay. Um, I haven't seen a lot of that um, at the when I worked at the VA. They had a really beautiful system. Not only did it have your your risk assessment, <laughs> but then it would pull up all the interventions that you could mark in those subcategories, which really made planning and care planning really slick. Actually, so I'm glad to hear that you've got that available to you. I think that's really helpful for nurses. So, uh, risk assessment according to the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, these are kind of the key points for risk assessment and what you want to include as part of your evidence. And this is evidence based, um, it's published on their website. You can easily access this. This is one of I think there's four, and I'll touch on a little on some of those other ones as we move along through the slides. Um, and then, why do we do risk assessment? Well, <clears throat> the evidence supports the use of a, a validated risk assessment tool um, for all patients that are entering hospitals, other ki types of care settings, skilled care, hospice, long-term care. And the existing evidence, based on what we know now, the current evidence, um, demonstrates that there's three primary pressure ulcer skin risk assessments or tools, I kind of call them tools, that provide a valid um, predictive screening for people um, who are more likely to develop a pressure ulcer. And that's the Braden, the Norton, and the Waterloo. I always want to call it Waterloo. I don't know why. <laughs> I, apparently, I have this problem with, with some kind of phraseology a little bit. Um, and the evidence demonstrates that the, the Braden and then the Norton and then the Waterloo have the strongest supporting evidence um, in the literature uh, about affordability and reliability in um, risk assessment and predicting um, uh, uh, pressure ulcer development. Um, and there are pretty robust uh, studies in most all care settings uh, with those three pressure ulcer risk tools. I would have to say the Braden probably has the most literature and studies that I've done with that. So I wanted to um, just kind of focus in on the individual assessments. Um, why do we do risk assessment? Well, it does a couple things. First of all, it really focuses um, and, and is a kind of a critical piece in our clinical decision making. It also helps us focus on strategies for intervention so that we don't waste um, resources on people who don't necessarily have that as a risk predictor. So in other words, if somebody is a you know, on their Braden is a three or a four in immobility, you don't want to put a low air loss mattress on that person. You're wasting resources. And the risk assessments help you funnel that decision making a little bit in a kind of an organized manner in doing that. So it allows you to target those interventions that you're looking at. It also facilitates um, communication and uh, collaboration with your multi-team members. Um, when you are care planning, so everybody is on the same page um, with that. Risk assessment, however, um, does not exclude clinical judgment of the nurse who's performing the risk assessment. And I, I, most nurses are doing those risk assessments. I'm assuming all of you are familiar with that. But these other comorbidities are, also need to be somehow in your clinical decision making and determining what kind of interventions you're going to you're going to implement, set up for your patients. And Dr. Zagorin really did a nice job of kind of targeting those intrinsic and extrinsic factors together. I wanted to add in on, um, I tried to be fairly inclusive here, but I wanted to also point out that anybody that has had a stage ulcer three or four that's healed, you want to know that. Um, because that, as, he, as was mentioned, you know, healed skin from a pressure ulcer is never 100% in its tensile strength and as that collagen had remodeled and matured. It's always going to be a target area, and um, they, most of the studies that I have seen in, 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 in the past have kind of suggested that it reach about 80% of that tensile strength. I also think that... It would be really interesting to do some studies, but spinal cord injured people, 
I think their tensile strength is even lower than 80% when they've had a healed stage sacral or ischial ulcer. So I kind of would be interested in seeing if that's the case because I think those people are really at high risk if they've had a pressure ulcer that's healed um, and certainly if they've had any flap surgery done as well. So looking at the Braden score specifically, um, it's most widely known and it's most widely used and most people are really familiar with it. It has a pretty high uh, uh, rating of sensitivity. The, rate, the sensitivity has uh, been suggested as high as 100%. Um, and their specificity is also pretty high, which makes it a really valid tool for predicting likelihood of pressure ulcer development. The other thing is, is it has a, I think if I remember right, this has been years ago, um, that the inner reader reliability of the Braden is also very high in the 90% uh, range. And the highest level of inner reader reliability was with LPNs. So when you had one LPN and another LPN look at the same ulcer, they came up with almost identical scores. It was a little different with RNs, um, not quite as high, but still in that 90% R range. So that, that's a really good tool. Um, the Braden was developed by Barbara Braden, um, and it was developed and studied in mostly the long-term care elderly population. It's still a very strong tool for your elder population. Um, <clears throat> but it, it, it may not be quite as strong in some of our younger adult populations, and um, they have adapted the Braden for pediatrics, and I'll kind of put those up on the slide too. It, you know, as you all know, it's divided into subcategories, and you rate those one to four, the lower the score on the subcategories, as well as the total score um, inc indicates higher risk. Um, so your your total scores indicate low, moderate, high risk, but your subcategories indicate uh, where your interventions are going to be focused. So a pretty useful tool. And how many, how many in the room are using the Braden score scale? Okay. Anybody else using a different scale? OK, we are all on the same page there. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the Norton scale. Has anybody heard about the Norton? familiar with that? Ever used the Norton? I haven't either, but it was the first pressure ulcer risk assessment tool that was developed, and it was developed in 1962. Uh, this pressure um, ulcer risk tool uh, does have a fairly high sensitivity and specificity when we're looking at, um, so these numbers here represent cut points on the, on the tool. So it has a pretty high specificity for cut points around 14. And the, again, the lower the number, the higher the risk. So 14, kind of right in that moderate range there, um, pretty high there. And the Norton, the predictive value of the Norton in some studies have suggested that there's a higher predictive value of the Norton scale when it's performed by nurses who are actually doing the physical care at the bedside. So it increases that validity when the nurses at the bedside are actually completing the, the scale, in other words. Um, what I like about it is it does, you can't really see that, and I apologize for the smallness of the print, but this area down here, these include real similar to the Braden, but this down here, it includes some metabolic parameters, so um, hematocrit, hemoglobin, albumin levels, I think, are included there, and you would write in those values. I like that. I think that's helpful information. But what it does is it increases nursing time and labor to complete that. You look up the labs. You got to write it down. And if you were doing a Braden assess or a risk assessment every shift, that can get really tedious and time consuming. So. Yeah. Include your nurses in on making decisions about risk assessment tool because they may say, oh my God, that's going to be crazy. I'm not going to be able to do that. <laughs> We're too busy at the bedside. We can't do that. Um, and then there's the water low. Has anybody heard of the water low? Anybody ever used the water low? Not heard about it? Again, neither had I until I prepared for this presentation. 
But I thought this tool was really kind of cool, actually. I really kind of liked it. And the, the st some studies have suggested that this particular tool has a higher predictive value um, for hospitalized patients. So thinking about your hospitalized patients, this may be a, a more predictive tool to consider for especially maybe your high-risk populations, ICU, surgical cardiac care units, um, those kind of high specialty units. It does include all the subcategories of you know, continence, mobility, um, and uh, nutrition. It does have some um, malnutrition um, kind of specific uh, parameters here that you would score. It includes anemia, smoking. I don't know why smoking made it and some of the other ones <laughs> didn't, mm -hmm. um, but it's on there. And so um, those also are kind of um, helpful. But again, that's going to take more nursing time to complete that. And people, you know, are busy at the bedside. These are high paced, high demand areas that you all are working in. So something that's simple that you can, you know, get to what you need to know and, and then move on to the next thing. And for the water low, it's higher, higher the number, higher the risk. So it's a little different than the Norton and the Braden. And um, it has a pretty high or sensitivity, as, as high as some studies suggested, as high as 95%. But the water low has a really fairly low specificity. So it's not going to maybe screen out those people that don't need all those interventions as well as the other two, two tools. Um, I put as low as 10%. Most of what I saw was more around the 40% for so, um, specificity readings on that. So what are some kind of summarizing, looking at these three different tools? The water low and the Braden were the most sensitive at, at identifying people who were more likely to develop a pressure ulcer when it was applied in a wide range of hospital setting. The best specificity scores were found in the Norton, that was really high, followed by the Braden. So it doesn't tell you, well, you should use this one, does it? <laughs> it's really a hard choice to make. And I think universally people have selected the Braden. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the cut points really <coughs> depend on your patient population and you had and looking at that and determining that there had been there was a recent study I came across that indicated there has been some recent debate about the Braden in terms of the cut point I think um, do you all, do you all have an identified cut point on your Bradens where you kind of say okay this person's at risk anything below that's no. even higher risk you do What's that number? We have been below 18, and it actually turns red. And so then the nurses know that they have to do the intervention. Oh, great. So you, it 18? turns red into the, yep, okay. 18 below. Anybody else have different cut point numbers than 18? Oh, good. Well, if ours is below 12, it fires a consult to us. As a, the, we're, you're got, the specialty I'm nurse. Yeah. The, 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 the WLC nurse? nurse. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. That's hard. Well, we have one that goes to nutrition. Below 12. Oh, it's 12 or less. 12 or less, then it's going to automatically sweep well. Okay. Okay. It's not good. That's pretty consistent with the study I saw. My experience has been cut points of 16 in the hospital, and then long term care kind of used, used the cut point of 18. But I'm glad you're using 18 because this study suggested that the 16 does not adequately capture um, effectively that clinical situation. And Again, you know, it really doesn't matter which tool you use as long as you're selecting a tool that has a high degree of validity, validity and predictability. So those three are the primary ones that I know of that have those, those ratings of validity considered for new settings. This is the NP UAP um, published uh, guideline for risk assessment in terms of how you refine it. Um, they're suggesting for um, acute care that you do a risk assessment every shift. And it sounds like y'all are doing that anyway. So, um, you guys are way ahead of, the, ahead of the game. You don't even need me here. <laughs> um, have 
anybody has anybody seen these risk assessments? Yay! Excellent. Um, I didn't know there were specific ones for neonates and pediatrics, so I was really, really excited to see this. And it goes all the way from uh, birth or early birth to 18 years, so that's really good. And then there's a palliative care risk assessment tool as well. And I, I thought that was really, really um, helpful. And, and I mean, how many times you kind of go, well, people in palliative care they don't have the same comorbidities. They don't have the same kind of conditions that uh, someone who is an adult who's trying to recover from a health condition. So that is also available. Um, what I did not find for risk assessment for specific, for specific populations are risk assessments for people in the OR or going to OR, people who are um, in the ICUs the surgical ICU, cardiac care ICU, those high risk um, population settings. There's not a kind of specialized or standardized tool for that specific population. So I think y'all are probably using the Braden in that respect. So let's look at some of the um, prevention points and some interventions that are based on the, the subscales of the Braden. This is kind of giving you some um, some ideas about what to implement for some of your care planning. The first, this slide here, um, this again is the, the second area that the NP, uh, it should say uh, UAP down at the bottom, sorry about that, um, in terms of what you do for uh, skin protection. And they basically, those four bullet points are kind of a synopsis of what evidence-based practice looks like for that. So um, these are just basic principles. You could get more specific. Um, CMS has evidence-based guidelines that are available and published in their report. Um, and the WCN uh, Society, they published um, uh, evidence-based guidelines for pressure ulcer assessment, risk assessment, and prevention that's available. Unfortunately, I didn't bring a copy of that journal, but I did reference it. Uh, you may not be able to access it unless you have access to, like I say, a university a library because it's protected. You have to be a member of the organization to get the articles. But it's a really good, it's a really good article and includes the level of, end of, of evidence and in, in <coughs> their recommendation of that particular um, uh, intervention. Um, the NP uh, UAP uh, also um, also has um, kind of summarized uh, bullet points for positioning and mobilization. Again, turning and repositioning, and again, that's really based on the patient. If some patients may need to be turned every hour, some um, every two hours. In general, that's kind of that that threshold mark where we go to every two hours. Um, I don't know about you, but some patients don't want you to turn them at all. <laughs> and uh, so you have to work with that. You have to educate your patients. You have to educate your families about why that's important. Teach your patients how to reposition themselves. Teach them how to be mobile. Don't do it for them if they can do it for themselves. I think we're really good about getting in there and helping people, but these are people that want to go home. These are people that we want to keep functional and maximize their independence. And so a way to do that is letting them do those little things in the bed or those little position shifts while they're in the chair. Um, have a turning schedule in the long-term acute care environment that I worked in. Uh, we, had, we had our uh, text write down the time the patient was last turned. Uh, some people, some places I've seen, they use turn teams. So the odd hours this team goes, the even hours this team goes. So however you want to do that, um, just make sure it's it's everybody knows what that is, and not only that it's on the clear <laughs> plan, but that it's getting done. That's what surveyors are looking at right now. Is not just that you have a care plan, but is it getting done? So uh, I'm not going to go into any of the nutrition stuff with Carrie giving her presentation right after that. I'm really excited to hear what she has to say in the area of nutrition. I think it's wide open. I think nutrition is a really big area. I think there's a lot of um, 
impact nutrition provides in wound healing, as Dr. Zagorin um, um, also uh, talked about this morning. So let's talk about the Braden, specifically the subscores, uh, sensory perception. Um, I'm not going to go over this and bore you with these. You probably already have these on probably your targeted electronic record where it kind of brings up those interventions. You check them and you, and you, you implement that. So basically, redistribution surfaces. Um, redistribution surfaces, they're really useful. Um, they're expensive. They're usually a daily rental, and I think sometimes they're like, I think the low air loss ones are like around $20, $40 a day for renting those, the, those dynamic surfaces. A low air loss has a pump. They're considered dynamic, meaning you've got a pump circulating air and baffle, baffling um, in the surface. The, most of the studies for mattresses were done in comparison to a standard hospital mattress. And most of those studies are, are dated because what I see in hospital mattress surf, uh, that are available today, and I see these at our vendor uh, shows uh, when I go to those, is that these mattresses are really awesome. I mean, they are not your grandmother's bed mattress uh, at all. So, and that's what they use, that's what they compared those, these, these specialty services to. Nowadays, those hospital mattresses have really highly compressible uh, foam in them. They, re, they, they, re, they have a rebound to them that's really nice. They're really dense and they're very thick. So for people who are not at very high risk, Typically, that's probably going to be an adequate surface, but then if you get into your higher risk population, you're probably going to consider doing a, a low air loss. Although, um, and they're, they're, I would always put somebody who has a stage three or stage four pressure ulcer on a low air loss mattress. Um, there is another um, mattress that's available, it's called the Dolphin. Has anybody heard of that or used one of those? It's becoming more and more common. It, it kind of has replaced the Clinitron, and it's a little different. It's different than the low air loss. Um, when the patient moves on the surface, it's kind of like a smart mattress. It adjusts the pressure distribution in the mattress according to how the patient is positioned in the bed. So it kind of it kind of adjusts to that movement of the patient. Um, and, and they're not nearly as expensive. Those you know Clinitrons of the old days where beasts move around. <laughs> and really, really unaffordable as far as um, care. Although I do think some plastic surgeons still like to have their patients post flap on the clinitrons. Uh, of course, elevating and protecting heels and handling uh, devices. The, the prophylactic um, silicone dressings, the Mepilex dressings, uh, are, are you using those in your ICUs as protective skin care? There's evidence to support that. Yeah, there, there's actually evidence to support that, so you are doing that. And also for the heels as well, some of the, the silicone dressings on the heels for those high-risk populations. Some of the interventions with moisture, uh, you want to clean the skin, you want to use kind of pH balance cleansers. Most hospitals uh, use a, a you know, bottle cleanser. Um, I see mostly the sage bath wipes as, as kind of the kind of uh, cleanser. And those bath wipes for perineal cleansing, they have dimethicone in them, so it kind of lays down a barrier um, already, kind of an invisible film barrier. Um, we do recommend, and the NP, um, UAP also recommends, to avoid incontinence briefs in bed. For people who are incontinent, it, it's... Um, Traps moisture, especially if they're incontinent. I and the WCN supports that as well. However, I think with a little caveat to that, when you have patients that are highly, you know, moving around in the bed, they're throwing the sheets off. The sheets are off. The rails are up. You're worried about them getting out of bed, or they do get out of bed and they're walking around butt naked <laughs> because they took off their gown along with the sheets. For me, that's a dignity issue. And I think there's some patients you really have to weigh, you know, if 
I've got a patient that's that active and they're stooling and they're urinating and they're all over the bed and there's no cover to them, to me that's more of a problem than just putting them in a pair of briefs. Um, so, you know, look at the patient. Again, it's individualizing the care and then care planning that on your care plan. And, and then you'll want to make sure that that particular patient is getting checked and changed uh, on a regular basis and their skin is getting clean. So let's talk about skin barrier films and ointments. Um, there's lots of products on the market that are available um, for uh, barrier um, protection. The one thing I want, to, want you to walk away with is that there's no one barrier that's been identified as superior to any other in the studies, in the literature. What is in the literature in terms of barriers is the most effective barrier to use is the one that's at the bedside. <laughs> oh, okay, we need to move along. So if it's available to the CNAs and it's, and, and it's there at the bedside, it's gonna get used. And so try to eliminate those barriers between the patient and the ointment. Um, it doesn't require a nurse a physician's order to put camelceptine on somebody. It might be a cost issue with your pharmacy, but there's other ways you can get around it. Oh my gosh, we got to move along. <laughs> <laughs> so for uh, activity, again, mobilizing people. Um, involve your PTOT. I think that's really important. Look at little type, little shifts in, in um Movement are, are also helpful. You don't have to be a, do a big movement every time you're repositioning somebody. Nutrition, I'm just going to skip over that. And then friction and shearing. There are different types of injury that get used interchangeably a lot. Friction is a kind of a in-level down, top-level down injury. Rubbing, moving the heels on the surface. Shearing is actually a deep injury where you, the capillaries and the small vessels get strangulated and they tear. And then you have inflammation and you have this process of, of injury, typically over the sacrum is where I see shear injury. So if you see a sacral injury, think about shearing um, in terms of the pressure. Ulcer assessment, we're looking at the type of ulcer. You want to really discriminate, is it pressure? Is it an ulcer from a different means? And sometimes that can be really difficult to determine. And this is where your WLC nurses are going to be coming in really helpful to identify, you know, this over an ankle bone, for instance. That might be an arterial more uh, ulcer. The underlying etiology is that mixed with the pressure. You certainly want to address the pressure. But that tissue is already compromised due to poor arterial vascular flow. The size, measuring it, length, depth, and getting a um, width on that um, odor. What I look for for odor is persistent. Is it lingering? And that is after you clean it. Some of these extended wear dressings, you take them off, you go, oh, God, Kelly, that really stinks. Like, you got to do something about that. Well, lots of times it's just the drainage being trapped. And so once you clean that away, you shouldn't have that lingering odor. What does the drainage look like? Perlins, bloody, um, or both. You're going to look at the peri wound area. And then you're going to stage ulcer. And we'll kind of go into staging a little bit. Photographing ulcers, it was brought up this morning. You have to develop protocols in your hospital about photographing. There's no published evidence-based guideline that says you either have to or you don't. But there are guidelines that will help you establish those protocols. The big thing about photographs, who's going to protect? It's, it's patient-protected information. Who's going to protect those photographs? Where are they going to be stored? And then it never is a substitute for the written assessment, and that includes these characteristics here. And there's some legal debate about the benefit versus not the benefit, benefit of the photograph with ulcers. Um, utilize your experts for staging. I know not everybody is comfortable with staging. Um, you have one person identified that does your staging and does your expert do the staging? Do nurses at the bedside do the staging? Is it all over the place? It's all about two. It's all about two. Nurses don't feel comfortable. I agree with that. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, I think it's an area, you know, it, it's an area where the more you do it, the better you right. get at it. Right. Yeah. I have a question for you, Kelly. 
So um, one of the things that I've heard as a, as a practice, I don't know if it's evidence-based, but a best practice is if people don't feel comfortable staging, at least document the description of the wound. Yes. And then call on the specialist to come in and do the staging. Exactly. So what are you seeing? What does it look like? What, you know, so what color you're, is you're it? recognizing it, but then calling somebody else in to stage it. Exactly. Okay. I think that's a good principle to work with. And then let your expert actually stage it. But you want to have something documented, yes. okay? Um, and if you've got depth, you're probably a, you're a stage three if you've got any measurable type of depth depth on your ulcer. We only stage for pressure ulcers, and we never reverse stage. Remember that. Can I just make one comment? Yes. So yeah. our our um, we have Epic, and so our bedside nurses they'll if it if they think it could be pressure, they have the option to put potential pressure injury, and then that's how they document, and then that flags us to go back and restage oh. or say no, it's moisture or you know. So at least it's documented in their admission assessment, and then it automatically notifies us. That's a that's a great way to get around. That. That's really so then how soon are you guys able to get to that? Because per CMS, those wounds of the pressure related have to be documented within a certain time frame. But they're documented. They're, 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 they're documented on admission. They're just not staged. They're just not staged. Well, that's what we were doing at our facility, but then it came out that they have to be staged mm -hmm. on so admission. Usually we yeah. state, I mean, usually we see them within 24 hours. So even on hours. weekends. Yep. Uh, the weekends get a little sketchy. <laughs> but... Exactly. They've always said at least we can um, go back and say, and well, so based on the assessment and what was documented, this stage is a great suggestion. Too. So it's kind of like suspected deep tissue yes. injury. You're saying it's suspected yeah. stage three yeah. ulcer, and then you're letting your expert make that final determination. Okay, we got to move along. I'm so sorry. I've just taken up all your time. Um, these are kind of a repeat of what Dr. Zagorin presented this morning. Uh, I didn't know. He it's hard to know what uh, the other presenters are presenting, but I wanted to include staging as part of the Bless you. Bless you. Typically, a stage one can be reversible if you get early identification and early intervention. Not always, but sometimes they will not evolve into a stage two, three ulcer if you get early intervention on board with that. Stage two... Um, that's when the epidermis, the epidermal loss is, is, um, is gone. Um, intact blisters, serous filled blisters are considered to be stage two. I've read in the literature that um, NP UAP considers a blood filled blister to be a deep tissue injury. So there's a little bit of difference between serous and blood filled blisters in that respect. These typically heal pretty quickly and they should. Um, we should prevent a stage two from progressing to a stage three. That's what the surveyors and regulators want to see. So getting into stage three, this is a full thickness loss. Um, you can see the subcutaneous tissue there. You might have a little measurable depth. Anytime you see slough, it's a stage three. Um, and stage four ulcers, these are the deeper ulcers, cavity type ulcers. You may have bone, muscle, tendons, joint capsules exposed as well. When you're assessing a stage four ulcer, a little, some people are hesitant. I, I um, have become accustomed to not only looking, sometimes what you see is not what's going on. And I put my finger in a cavity and kind of sweep or fill the base and I felt bone even when I couldn't see it. So kind of do a little bit, and your WLC nurses, I'm sure, are, are doing that and can help with that as well. There's a comfort level with that, I think. Unstageable, of course, this is dead skin. This is a, this is a unstageable ulcer that needs to be debrided because the edges are pulled away. You can see the yellow rim, the halo around there. That means the eschar is an, no longer intact. It's not acting as a protective layer anymore. Sometimes if this was all intact and it was on a heel, I'd probably leave it alone unless it starts looking like this. Um, deep tissue injury, Dr. Zagorn presented that very well this morning. I'm not going to um, belabor that. But I did want to talk about mucosal ulcers because the majority of hospital-acquired pressure ulcers are due to a medical device and mucosal injuries. So I don't have time to really go through each one of the bullets, but it's in your handout. Review those, use those to use that to guide you. Medical device injuries, 
were really high there for a while. Um, they have decreased, and I think that's because it, the word has gotten out. NPAUP has really done a nice job. I did want to end with this. We'll end with this because I don't, I'm going to cut all of my time. This chronic tissue injury, has anybody heard about this? Oh my God, it is fascinating. And I'm so glad we have something that we can kind of identify or call it because I've been calling it recliner butt. Recliner, recliner butt, those people that kind of sit in their recliners all the time, the lazy boys. Um, and um, then they start sleeping in their recliners. You get this really odd discoloration and somebody has identified it. And I'm happy to say, they are friends and colleagues of mine at Unity Point um, at home here in Des Moines, Mary Mahoney and Barb Rosenboom. They took the time to identify and actually kind of label this. And the, the distinguishing characteristics of it is that it happened, it's identifiable on the fleshier parts of the buttocks. It'd be easy to call this a deep tissue injury, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, but you can see it's not right over the sacrum. It ha it's more on the fleshy part. You get this lentification of skin, and sometimes this will peel away, and it'll peel away, and it'll bleed forever. Um, the other thing is, is that it really doesn't change. It really doesn't evolve over time. It doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any worse. You may have ulcers uh, that develop in the middle and that you need to, to treat, but... Um, and these are some of the distingu distinguishing characteristics of the chronic tissue injury compared to some of our other skin injuries. Ah, and this was published in June of this year in the WCN Youth Journal, so really happy about that. So I am going to stop here, and I'm sorry I didn't get through the rest of the <coughs> slides, but you have them available on your handout. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure to be here.